So, hi. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Fiona. I am a developer and also a consultant with ThoughtWorks. Uh, today, I want to speak with all of you about the social implications of bias in machine learning. Before we get started on this topic, uh, I would like to make sure we're all on the same page with a few of the terms that I'm using here. So, just to start off, when I say bias, what do I mean? Sorry, one moment. Great. My clicker now works. So, when I say bias, what am I talking about? Let's have a look at, yeah, let's have a look at a few examples from just our everyday life. So, here's one. I won, so gambling must have been a great idea. So this is outcome bias, and I haven't presented this talk in a casino before, um, but this could potentially lead to poverty. We've got an, a man walking alone at night. Um, maybe he's scary or dangerous. This is stereotyping, and this could lead to fractioning in society. What about uh, people often say that mobile phones cause cancer? Well, it's not true, but it's the bandwagon effect, or groupthink, which can lead us to incorrect decision-making and also be negative for society. What I want to clarify here, though, is that I'm talking about social bias specifically and not statistical bias. The reason I want to make this clarification is because when we read about statistics and machine learning and we practice these things, we do hear a lot about statistical bias. And so I want to just call up front that that isn't what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is social bias, and by that I mean prejudice, whether that is a conscious or an unconscious prejudice. So this is some kind of negative thought process about a group um, based on a protected attribute like race or sex or age. And I'm not talking about this statistical bias. Now, the thing I'm not talking about, I'll quickly define as well, is when we measure something, we take a lot of measurements of that thing, and we average them out. And then the comparison between that average and the thing we tried to measure, that's statistical bias, but I'm not talking about that. Which is great, because it means we get to chat about the human condition rather than hear about maths. Now, I'm not saying that bias is, is flawed entirely and that we shouldn't have it at all. That would be impossible. It's just too much information, and we need to be able to make decisions. So we take shortcuts, and that's fine. It gets us through our day. But the only problem is when these decisions that we make and these shortcuts that we take reinforce existing um, things in society that we don't want to reinforce. The other topic we need to define here is machine learning. So for the context of this talk, I'm curious, who here currently practices something in the ML space? Okay, so there's like five and a half hands. Um, and who feels they already really understand what machine learning is? Okay, maybe like half, great, cool. So just for the rest of the people here, um, please bear with me. So I'm gonna use the terms algorithms and statistical models pretty much interchangeably in this talk when I'm talking about machine learning. In this context, they're gonna mean the same thing. Uh, and what I mean is a computer system that performs a specific task. So I'm not talking about generalized AI, and I mean a task that is performed without explicit instruction. So not a bunch of if-else statements just dressed up as machine learning, but actually something based on patterns and inferences. For an example, this would be we have some kind of question that we want an answer to, we have some data that relates to that question, we use the majority of that data to generate a model, which we then test using the remaining data to see if that model accurately is able to work that out. For example, we have the likelihood of a candidate being hired. That might be our question. And then we want to say, all right, what data do we need for that? We might have the resumes and the hiring outcomes of past applicants. And we can correlate that data to try and determine what is the likelihood of this person being a successful candidate. And then using information about who was hired, we can determine if this algorithm actually works. For another example, uh, more in the, in the image recognition space, these are two pictures that I took of cats. In order to find these pictures for the talk, I was looking through my Google Photos library, and I was just scrolling. It was a bit tedious, um, but I was looking for pictures of cats, and I was remembering experiences I'd had of cats. Usually it's indoors, they're quite fluffy, this many limbs, that kind of thing, um, to try and work out which ones are cats. 
But I got bored, and so I just wrote cats into my Google Photos library, and it came up with these. But the way that Google and its algorithms determined these were cats is not the same as the way I was looking at it and trying to work it out. Because all that they have is a collection of pixels, just a 2D array of pixels. They can't use the same inferences that I'm making. So I imagine, and I don't know, that probably this is something like the way that those models were trained. So there was a bunch of labeled photos. These ones are cats. These ones are not cats. Fed through to create an algorithm that could determine this is a picture of a cat. But the catch here is if we spoke to the development team who had created that, that algorithm, they probably couldn't tell you in this third layer of processing, the pixel two to the left on the bottom row, how much does that impact whether or not it's determined to be a picture of a cat? Because they're relying on the great power that is ML to be able to have these kinds of systems that we could never imagine ourselves and might not even be able to comprehend. But they are somewhat of a black box, and that is a two-edged sword. So what we might gain in accuracy from having something so large scale, so complex that we couldn't have envisioned it ourselves, and we can't even comprehend it, we do lose out a bit in the observability side. And I want to touch on this later and the risks that that can have. So how's this talk going to go down? Well, I want to take you on a journey, starting at the data collection, going through with the way that data is managed, how the model is generated, and then in the end, how that product is used and governed. Throughout this, there are six different main steps I want to touch upon and look at examples from the real world, potential risks, and ways that we can really mitigate this with actual tools. So that's quite a journey, and we don't have long, so let's get started. Starting with where everything starts in these things, it's always with data. And really, it starts when that data is first collected. We all have a bunch of data sitting in a lake somewhere back at the office that we really want to use. We think, oh, we've already got it. It's so much data. Let's, let's go ahead. But ideally, we want to stop here and think about why that was collected, under what circumstances. Is it really data that relates to our question? For this, I'd like to share a story about something that happened in Boston. So in Boston, they had a lot of potholes in the city. But what they didn't know is where the potholes are and whether or not they're impacting people's lives. Do they really need to be fixed? So what they did, like any modern city, is they created an app. So this app used the accelerometer in the phone and the GPS. And you would put it in the passenger seat while you were driving along, and it would measure, was there a pothole that you went over? Really cool stuff. And they discovered all these potholes, but mostly in really rich suburbs, which had them scratching their head. Why? And it wasn't until they added the same app onto phones on garbage trucks and on public buses they discovered they were missing so many potholes. And it was because of the way that they were collecting that data. Mostly, they were just seeing data from the phones of very wealthy people who have their own private vehicles and a spare seat and a modern phone with plenty of battery who really cared about collecting this data. But they weren't getting a real picture of what the potholes in the city looked like. And this is because data really doesn't speak for itself as much as we claim. It does echo its collectors. Like if I was to ask you about your earnings, and I did so as the tax office, or as someone who you're on a second date with, or as a friend of yours who's having financial hardship, you might paint a slightly different picture of that information because of the person collecting it. Another quote I really like on this one is that data being raw is both an oxymoron and <laughs> a really bad idea, but to the contrary, it should be cooked with care. I think these term, this term cooked with care is a really good one because if we understand that the time and who collected this data is going to do something to change it, then the idea is only to make sure that we're careful in those decisions and that we're aware of them. In machine learning, we often talk about garbage in, garbage out. I would argue we could also say bias in, bias out. But what can we do about this? So one potential tool is open data, um, sorry, the data ethics canvas by the data ethics, um, by the Open Data Institute, sorry. So they have this, this great canvas in all of those white boxes. There would actually be a series of questions that you can ask your team. I'll go through a couple that I think are really 
important for this topic. So one is, could this product we're developing have negative effects on people? They ask questions like, could it cause harm? Could it be used to target or profile or prejudice people? Um, could it unfairly restrict access? Or could people perceive it to do these things? Because in some ways, perceptions are reality. They also ask about minimizing impact. So they say, how could we measure the impact so that we can then act if we find something is wrong? To summarize this, all data is, is biased in some way and needs to be collected carefully and intentionally. We should be skeptical of the data we already have because it may not have been collected under these sort of ways. And there are a few tools, another also by uh, Ethical OS, that have a series of questions we can ask in our teams about the data we are collecting and using. So next up on data, we have the filtering of the, the data that we have collected. This might sound crazy. Why would you filter out or delete data? You want more of it, right? It sounds more impressive. The more data you have, surely the more accurate things are. Um, I'd like to question that here. Starting with a story about audition-only orchestras. So there were some historical contexts where audition-only orchestras, or orchestras in general, were mostly made up of men. And this made sense because those were the people with access to education and, and leisure time to learn instruments. But as that changed, for some reason, the makeup of these orchestras was not changing. And so an idea that was had was to close the curtain during the auditions so that the people who were making the decision could not see who they were making that decision about. So this was to remove the visual data from the, from the calculation. But surprisingly, this didn't seem to help. They were still ending up with not very diverse um, orchestras. So what they discovered was, if they asked everyone to remove their shoes before they auditioned, suddenly women could play instruments. It was because of the clip, clap, clip, clap of the heels walking onto the stage that the judges already knew, somewhere in their subconscious, the gender of the person who was about to perform. And this was enough. So when they removed that data, they actually got the better musicians, the people who made better, um, better music with their instruments. And so that led to a better outcome. And this was by decreasing the data. There are some laws, one in, in my um, home country of Australia, which protects all of these attributes from any decisions about hiring or promotion or firing. None of these can legally be used um, as attributes for that. And there are some similar laws in, in Germany, where I now live, and in many EU countries, that state that these, and even proxies to some of these values, can't be used in hiring decisions. By proxy, what I mean is if I knew, for instance, somebody's high school, I might be able to infer maybe their gender or their nationality. What's really powerful about if we're using algorithms to make decisions is that we can decide exactly what information we feed in. Because if we have, say, one recruiter who's got a bit of a bias, that's going to have this much impact. But if we have an algorithm which has a bit of bias, it's going to have this much impact. But fortunately, we can also decide with these algorithms in things that aren't audition choirs, but any kind of job or any other decision, exactly which data we exclude and exactly which data we do let impact those decisions. So I guess... This is kind of the summary, is to really let go of that, as, as difficult as it is, is to let go of those things that can actually lead to less accurate decisions. In summary, there are plenty of legal constraints that are applicable in many industries that might require someone to delete data. We can also sometimes increase the accuracy of our algorithms through the deletion of some of the data that it was trained on. And forgetting might be really hard for us, but it's easy for machines. Even if we've told them something, we can delete it, and it won't know anymore. The third part on our three-part trilogy on data is the addition of missing data. But how can data really be missing? I mean, if, if we didn't observe it, and it wasn't there, then it truly isn't real. But could we have missed it? Or is it possible it doesn't exist yet, but is applicable to decisions we're making about the future? Because really, when we're making predictions, 
we don't just want to hear what the past implies, but what the future is likely to be. For instance, when we raise children, it's very similar to how we raise machines. Um, we probably wouldn't say to our child, oh, let's go to the doctor and see what he thinks. We would probably say, unless we were talking about a specific male doctor, we would probably say, let's go to the doctor and see what they think. Because we don't want to imply to our daughter that she couldn't one day be the doctor. Or surprise anyone when they show up to the doctor's surgery and it's not he. And we do this for the same reason, because we realise that we're raising a child who needs to exist in a world in the future. And that we probably hope or expect that in that world, doctors will be all kinds of genders. An example of language use using Google Translate, I've picked the language Malay here, uh, and it's me, you can see my picture in the top. Um, you can play along if you'd like. Um, so I wrote some, some words in Malay, and the reason I picked this language is because it has this really cool gender-neutral pronoun where it says they are, and it doesn't mean multiple people, it just means one person. They are a blah. So you can guess, by its inclusion in this talk, what these are going to translate to when I go to English. But yeah, it seems that Google Translate thought he was more likely to be a doctor and she was more likely to be a nurse. But I can understand why it is that Google Translate did this. Because if I was trying to make this algorithm, I would get all the data that I have, everything that tells me sentences in these two languages, and I would compare and contrast. And what I would probably find is more instances of he being a doctor. And that's understandable because historically that was the case. But these are historical patterns that we probably don't want to reinforce. And so what can we do? Well, Google have done one thing for a few languages, including Turkish. They now show these alternative translations. So you can have, this, this could translate into either of these sentences. And they also have plans to make this work beyond the gender binary as well, which I think is great. Because the reality is, if we want accurate data, we're getting gender parity for doctors. And so if we want to have a translation system that works into the future and accurately translates the meaning of the words, not just makes comments about the societies, um, we, we do need to start thinking about how recent the data we're using is and what our expectations are in the future. Someone I'd like to introduce is Joy. Um, so she started something called the Algorithmic Justice League. Uh, she's a researcher at MIT Media Lab, and she did her, um, I think, her master's thesis about facial recognition software from a few different providers, Face++ and IBM and Microsoft's equivalent services, and specifically looked at how accurate they were when looking at people of different genders or of different nationalities. And what she found from this was that women of colour are much, more le are much less likely to be accurately recognised than other groups. She discovered this when she was working on an art piece using facial recognition software herself, and I would like to share her experience. The system I was using worked well on my lighter skinned friend's face, but when it came to detecting my face, it didn't do so well, until I put on a white mask. So I think this is a really great example of how sometimes when we're missing data, we might not have a product that's fit for purpose. Because this is facial recognition software, and that was a face, but it couldn't recognize it. So um, something that Joy talks about in her activism work is how having teams who are more diverse and more representative of the groups who they impact can really help in missing these accidental bits of data that were not included. And we didn't really need more arguments for diversity in teams. We've already seen plenty of research that shows that this has higher financial returns and also better decision making. But in case we wanted another reason, um, there's this as well. If for some reason that's impossible, there are some cool tools. So this is the Tarot Cards of Tech, which recently made it onto the ThoughtWorks technology radar. Uh, it's a set of different cards that ask questions. So you can use them to ask questions of yourself and your team about, about the product you're building. The one I want to call out here is The Forgotten, which talks about who are the people who we might not have considered when we were building this product. A question I, I like to ask is, who would give a one-star review 
and why. I can imagine that Joy would have given a one-star review, and I can think about why, but if we can predict these things beforehand, then we might be able to build a product that doesn't get that review to begin with. Another tool is by uh, Google Pair, their AI plus people research group. Um, sorry, people plus AI research group, that's so on. Uh, so this is some UCI census data. It's not super important to be able to read all of it, but this tool helps in order to show which groups are being really well represented by the data set that you have and which groups are not so well represented. So it's showing that this census income data mostly seems to represent men who are married, who are professionals, who are white. And that's awesome if we're trying to make predictions about that group. It's probably going to do a really good job to make predictions about them. But if we are actually trying to, to have a model which speaks to a larger audience than that, then we can see here really clearly what data is missing and we can try to fill in those gaps. So to summarize, sometimes without missing data, we can have a product that's not fit for purpose. Diverse teams are one approach to this, or at least diversity in the people we consider as our users. And also Google Pairs facets and facets drive are pretty cool tools as well um, that don't require very much programming as well. Next, I want to touch on observability, that issue we brought up at the beginning, and justification. So by that, I mean, how can we explain the model or how it works? So we'd all be familiar with and remembering the GDPR, uh, pretty cool legislation that had a segment about automated decision making. And specifically, it stated that the data subject has the right to know about the existence of automated decision making and get meaningful information about the logic involved. I really like this because it means we have to open that black box. And the last part where it says they also need to have some information about the envisioned consequences of that decision is great too because it means that we in teams really need to think about so that we can explain those potential impacts and consequences. So we have to open the black box, which I know I'd previously stated might not be possible. And we ideally don't want to open this by using simpler algorithms, by not being able to take advantage of the cool tools, the nice tech, and the, the accuracy that we can gain. So we need a different way, something, something else on top of what we're already doing. And we don't just want to do this because it's regulated. I mean, if I fix a bug, right, and I don't really know why it was broken to begin with, and I'm not entirely sure what I did to fix it, but it seems to work now, I probably haven't fixed it, or I definitely don't trust that I've fixed it and I won't see it again. So if I don't know why my model tests really well and seems to give the right result, then does it really do it for the right reasons? Does it actually work? Or is it just really fitting my data really well? And so I'd like to introduce a tool called Lime. So this is a research paper and also a Python library, as is often the case. So if you like pip installing things, this is something to play around with. It stands for Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations. Ah, that's a huge mouthful. Let me explain it from the bottom. So, explanations. This is what we're looking for. Something to explain why a decision was reached. Model agnostic. It doesn't matter. What are we using? Is it a random forest? Is it a neural network? Is it a support vector machine? Who cares? This works. Interpretable, as in the people can actually understand the reason why and local, as in local to the area the decision was made. Maybe it's still unclear. Um, to use the example that Lime used, this is a picture, and it has a p-value of 0.54, that it's probably a tree frog. So we think probably this image is a tree frog. But why, why did it come back to say, yes, this is probably a tree frog? Well, if we used Lime, what we could do is generate hundreds of thousands of different images similar to this one, but with some of the pixels just turned off. Or if it wasn't an image, some of the data points missing. And then see, what are the likelihoods of those different images or different data scenarios being a tree frog? And this can help to determine what was it about that, that set of pixels that made it seem more or less like a tree frog. And from there, we can start to see 
that line, exactly the area of the decision making, and an explanation that explains why. So we might have guessed before how this was working. It might have tested well, but now we actually see this is why it was considered to be a tree frog. And this is immensely powerful. It works for things that aren't pictures as well. But if that's too much Python, too much code, there's also Google Pair have something called the what if tool, which is just running in a browser and doesn't require any programming at all, um, that lets people do similar things, a little bit less powerful, of course. But you can change out some of the values in the data set and see how that impacts the results. So this gives a feeling for what was it about the data that led to that decision? And I think this is something powerful about machines that humans don't have, is when a person makes a decision, we're not really sure why they made that decision. Even when we ourselves make a decision, we might actually just have a post hoc justification as to why we made that choice, but do we really know why? <laughs> Potentially not. But with a machine with something like this, could we end up actually understanding why a decision was made, and therefore could we better assess whether it was accurate or fair? So to summarize, in order to trust, we need to understand why. Why does the thing seem to work? Lime is a tool that's really powerful to help us to open the black box. And also Google Pair's What If tool and IBM's um, AI Fairness 360 has some implementations of Lime and a few other uh, mechanisms. So that's a pretty cool one to check out as well. I'm not sponsored by either of those companies. Okay. So feedback loops, I want to quickly touch upon this. When the data that we're using impacts a decision that becomes future data that we want to use for our next model. Let's try with an example. So targeted advertising is fine. I'm OK to be shown pictures of things that I've already bought. But what about when I'm being targeted for something like a job application or some other kind of opportunity? Could this actually impact who ends up with an opportunity or in a role, and therefore who's likely to be seen as appropriate for that role. Recently, Facebook cut a little bit of, um, they, they got into a little bit of trouble in the media because they were found to be showing secretarial work and, and cleaning jobs, mostly to women, and to be showing a lot fewer high paid job ads to people of color. And this was not because the people who were trying to show the ads on the website were selecting these, these criteria. They selected much more neutral criteria. But Facebook's ad platform lets you see what were the demographics of the people who actually were shown your ad. And Facebook boasts about their algorithms that allows them to target people who would be more receptive to the ad that you have. And so they rightfully were criticized for the fact that they seemed to be reinforcing existing stereotypes in the way that these ads were being shown. Because it's the data that's leading to the creation of a model, but that model doesn't exist in a vacuum. It looks just like pretty code on our screen, but it becomes a real product that makes decisions. And those decisions can create outcomes, which can feed back into that data, and it creates like a cycle. So when I have some data about who I think would be interested in this job, and I train a model to show it to people, and then that makes a decision about who ends up in the, in the interview room, and that changes the outcome about who's hired, which impacts the data for my next model. Really, if we don't fix the bias at some point, we're just automating it, which is just increasing the scale of the problem. This problem already exists in the US. Uh, there's already tools being used in things like predictive policing and also in bail uh, and sentencing that have been shown with data to be biased. Things like predictive policing, with the more that you look, the more that you find, and things like bail and sentencing can really impact a person's future. ProPublica did an assessment of some of the data of this um, tool currently in use called Compass. And they looked at the two, the two failure cases that you're usually testing to try and avoid. So the first one is who was labeled as high risk of reoffending, but then actually didn't reoffend. So this is your false positives. And who was labeled as low risk, but then actually reoffended. So those are the false negatives, 
These are the two types of, of failure cases that we try and avoid when training a model. And it was found that for white people, it was much more likely to label someone as low risk, but actually they did reoffend. And yet that was flipped when looking at African American people. They were more likely to be miscategorized as more likely to reoffend, even when they didn't. And this would have significant impacts on those individuals and be inaccurate. So if we want to reinforce existing stereotypes and discrimination, this is how we do it. To try and find a silver lining here, we know already that plenty of courts of law also make bad decisions. Um, there's bias in, in all people as well, and, and they can definitely make mistakes. If we used tools maybe like Lime or got some observability on some of these things, then maybe we could end up with better decisions being made with automation. But I'm just I'm not seeing it yet in this case. To summarize, today's inputs are, oh sorry, today's outputs are tomorrow's inputs. And so we need to think about what we want to reinforce and which patterns we want to see more or less of. Lastly, for usage and, and governance. We aren't the first industry to face these kinds of problems, so it's, it's been there in statistics before, and we can learn from other industries and gain a better insight into how to release products to users and how they can be governed in a way that is safe. One example is pharmaceuticals. So if I buy a product off the shelf, it's going to tell me what are the capabilities of this product? What are its limitations? What can and can't it do? What is the active ingredient that actually is the magic that makes it work? When and how can I use it, or when shouldn't I use it? What safety measures have they implemented? In this case, there is that cap that helps children not overdose. And they'll also have a product recall. If they discover that this product is harmful, or even that it just doesn't actually work, they'll recall it. They might even pay you back for it. All of these could be applied to I would say most software projects, but especially for things like um, machine learning, where people seem to forget that even though it's a machine and they're very logical, it was trained by humans and they have their flaws. There were some recent very clickbaity titles, I guess maybe a year ago now, um, where Amazon's facial recognition software was matching 28 members of, of the US Congress to mugshots of criminals. And this was criticized by a spokesperson from Amazon because they were using in these tests the 80% default um, level of confidence. And this was deemed not enough for comparing mugshots to, to people. But what concerns me is that since this software is currently being marketed by Amazon to law enforcement, and the default is 80% confidence. I really hope that that default is different for the versions of the software that get deployed in police stations. Because if that's the measurement that they want to be measured on, then it should also be the default. And I can't see whether it is, but I really hope so. Since then, um, some, some jurisdictions have decided to not use this technology for these purposes. And Microsoft is even calling for regulation in this area. I mean, if, a com if an organization asks to be regulated, then you know there might be some problem there. But whose responsibility really is this? I mean, is it the government need to regulate within which jurisdiction? Is it us as consumers or as technologists who need to have some oath or demand better products? Is it about the media to call out these things when they see them? Is it the tech companies that have to be ethical? Whose responsibility really is this? One organization that I think did something quite excellent in this space recently was OpenAI. So OpenAI, as you'd imagine, they, they do AI stuff and then they open it up. And recently they didn't open something up, or not in full. Because what they discovered was they discovered an algorithm that could generate really realistic, believable text that seemed like it was written by a person. And that's really cool, but they thought about how that might impact the world, especially when paired with something like um, deep fakes. Because if we have the ability to both show a picture of someone who isn't real, 
and we've generated that from nothing. And we can also generate text without having any humans. How do we know what's real anymore? And they saw this risk, and so instead of releasing the product like they normally would, even though it was cool and exciting and took time and money, they instead released only a cut-down version and started a conversation about the risks, which I think is an excellent approach. Because if we do create a product that we think could be harmful, I think I at least would rather be known as the people who didn't release the harmful thing. And we can also patch. Unlike a lot of other industries that have to completely recall their product and give you a new one, we're able to provide updates really quickly. So in some ways, we are empowered to be able to solve this problem faster and, and more effect effectively. And this is another way in which it's a little bit better than people. If I want to impact society positively, I have to push out a whole person, raise them to be better, and then shove them into society. But if I want to fix some problem with software, I can simply push some code. And then if I've got proper CD and, and CI, then it will be in production. And that's a much faster way to make change. So to summarize, let's inform, warn, and restrict our users where we can to try and make safer use of products. We can all demand better products and governance. And unlike humans, we can quickly push updates to make things less harmful. In general, I want to summarize just what I've spoken about in this talk so far. We should understand that all data does have some inherent bias in the way that it was collected, what we decided to see and when. And so rather than only seeing the potholes in rich suburbs, we need to think about how it was collected and make sure that we are actually serving the whole community. One thing we can use is Open Data Institute's Data Ethics Canvas, um, an ethical OS, to consider some questions we might want to ask ourselves. It's really powerful that we can decide exactly which data our models see and which things they forget. In what other industries can we close the curtain and remove the shoes so that we can actually hire the best musician? Let's consider what data we can delete in order to get better outcomes. Diversity in teams is something that doesn't really require further, further reason. But if we had that, could we end up not suggesting that he was a doctor and that she was a nurse? Could we develop software that could see Joy's face? How can we open the black box and actually see how it is that our products work under the hood? We can use Lime and also other tools in order to find out for any kind of model, why does it work the way it does? And is it the way we expect it? If we are reinforcing existing biases and we've automated this, we're just going to increase the scale of that impact. So we need to consider what kind of feedback loops might exist in the products we're building. And how can we learn from other industries that have come before us and already made the embarrassing mistakes? And instead of making those mistakes ourselves, we can learn from them and make products that are better from the start or at least get recalled or improved when they're discovered to be damaging. I want to leave you with this statement. If not me, who? And if not now, when? We in the room, I believe, are all technologists. And we seem to understand that we are having a huge impact on society. But what I hope we now have an understanding of is how we can make that impact a more positive one. I'm happy to take any questions here or at some point later on if you'd prefer talk one-on-one. -on -one. And I've got some book recommendations if anyone wants more information. So, yeah, please feel free to ask questions.
and translate that he was a doctor as well. So how do you deal uh, with this approach to special programs? Okay, so I'm going to attempt to repeat the question because you weren't mic'd. Um, so this was a question about the Google Translate example. I believe you were mentioning that maybe there's context in the gender pronoun and therefore we might lose some his history or, or context and therefore end up with a worse translation if we don't retain that, that gender side of things. Um, I guess I really like Google's current solution where they show two alternate translations. Uh, I think that, uh, that that's one thing, but also since the, the language was actually gender neutral, it might it might still be more inaccurate to show he because that, that document didn't actually imply a gender necessarily. It, that, that gender implication came from the, the, the general averaging out of information. But um, yeah, I don't know if that really answers the question or maybe I've misunderstood it. Okay, yeah, maybe we can have a discussion. Sorry. Anyone else? None for now? Okay, maybe we can chat later. Thanks.